everyone, and welcome to Loop Lore, a quick deep dive into a folklore topic where I share some of the stories from around the world that have piqued my interest. Only, it's Christmas time, and I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to be indulging in a wonderful, more relatively recent festive tradition. If you consider a mere hundred years or so recent, I'm going to be reading non-folklore fiction. The tradition I shall be observing is that of reading ghost stories at Christmas Eve. It's not always currently observed, although it is enjoying more fun, intermittent modern revivals for some decades now. It's a Victorian thing, from where the modern version of Christmas as we know it comes. People will talk about it in the run-up to the 24th of December, and some television stations around the world have been good for leaning into this. I'm thinking especially the BBC here, but A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens is exactly what came of this tradition. Whether you're booting up Muppets or Scrooge the night before Christmas, you're enjoying what is a most excellent piece of traditional spooky festive fun. So, for Luke Law this holiday season, I want to bring you a story from M. R. James. Montague Rhodes James is a massively influential writer. Even if you aren't actively reading him, you'll undoubtedly have felt the mark he has left upon fiction involving ghosts and hauntings. At the very least, you'll probably have heard of Oh, Whistle and I'll Come to You, my lad. But even if you've never gone back to the source, you will definitely have come across a novel, short story, or movie that could be considered Jamesian. We stand on the shoulders of giants, after all. Even as time marches on, the ghost stories we have now are building upon and refining the craft of those who came before. I'm going to pull directly from Wikipedia here to explain the three elements of a classic Jamesian tale, because they've nailed this one. To quote from the M. R. James page, a Jamesian story will usually have some variation of these three key points. One. A characterful setting in an English village, seaside town, or country estate, an ancient town in France, Denmark, or Sweden, or a venerable abbey or university. 2. A nondescript and rather naive gentleman scholar as protagonist, often of reserved nature. 3. The discovery of an old book or other antiquarian object that somehow unlocks, calls down the wrath, or at least attracts the unwelcome attention of a supernatural menace, usually from beyond the grave. This really is a classic, and James originated the style so damn hard it's named after him. He has some interesting ideas about telling ghost stories I want to share before jumping onto the tale itself. His introduction to the 1911 More Ghost Stories of an Antiquary explains some of his rules in his own words. I think that, as a rule, the setting should be fairly familiar and the majority of the characters in their talks such as you may meet or hear any day. Another requisite, in my opinion, is that the ghost should be malevolent or odious. Amiable and helpful apparitions are all very well in fairy tales or in local legends, but I have no use for them in a fictitious ghost story. He had no time for a nice ghost, which has the horror fan in me hyped and excited for what I'm about to perform for you all. As a writer myself, I also want to commit his thoughts on protagonists down. This is from his Ghosts and Marvels collection in 1924, with some classic story pacing advice. Let us, then, be introduced to the actors in a placid way. Let us see them going about their ordinary business, undisturbed by forebodings, pleased with their surroundings, and, into this calm environment, let the ominous thing put out its head, unobtrusively at first, and then more insistently, until it holds the stage. For the ghost story, a slight haze of distance is desirable. Thirty years ago, not long before the war, are very proper openings. If a really remote date be chosen, there is more than one way to bring the reader in contact with it. The finding of documents about it can be made plausible, or you may begin with your apparition and go back over the years to tell the cause of it. On the whole, though not a few instances might be quoted against me, I think that a setting is so modern that the ordinary reader can judge of its naturalness for himself is preferable to anything antique. All of which can be found in a story I have for you this Christmas Eve, or whenever you listen to the episode of course. Any time is a good time for a great ghost story. We're going to an inn in Denmark for a story from M. R. James's 1904 short story collection, Ghost Stories of an Antiquary, and the strange events which take a turn for the terrifying of the poor soul who stayed in Room 12 at the Golden Lion. Room 13 by M. R. James among the towns of Jutland, Vibor justly holds a high place. It is the seat of a bishopric. It has a handsome but almost entirely new cathedral, a charming garden, a lake of great beauty, and many storks. Near it is Hald, accounted one of the prettiest things in Denmark, and hard by is Finderup, where Mark Stig murdered King Eric Lipping on St. Cecilia's Day in the year 1286. Fifty-six blows of square-headed iron maces were traced on Eric's skull when his tomb was opened 
in the 17th century. But I am not writing a guidebook. There are good hotels in Vibor. Prieslers and the Phoenix are all that can be desired. But my cousin, whose experiences I have to tell you now, went to the Golden Lion the first time that he visited Vibor. He has not been there since, and the following pages will perhaps explain the reason for his abstention. The Golden Lion is one of the very few houses in the town that were not destroyed in the Great Fire of 1726, which practically demolished the cathedral. The Sona Kirk, the Ra House, and so much else that was old and interesting. It is a great red brick house, that is, the front is of brick, with Corby steps on the gables and a text over the door, but the courtyard into which the omnibus drives is of black and white cage work in wood and plaster. The sun was declining in the heavens when my cousin walked up to the door, and the light smote full upon the imposing facade of the house. He was delighted with the old-fashioned aspect of the place, and promised himself a thoroughly satisfactory and amusing stay in an inn so typical of old Jutland. It was not business in the ordinary sense of the word that had brought Mr. Anderson to Vibor. He was engaged upon some researches into the church history of Denmark, and it had come to his knowledge that in the Ries Archive of Vibor there were papers, saved from the fire, relating to the last days of Roman Catholicism in the country. He proposed, therefore, to spend a considerable time, perhaps as much as a fortnight or three weeks, in examining and copying these, and he hoped that the Golden Lion would be able to give him a room of sufficient size to serve alike as a bedroom and a study. His wishes were explained to the landlord, and, after a certain amount of forth, and the latter suggested that perhaps it might be the best way for the gentleman to look at one or two of the larger rooms and pick one for himself. It seemed a good idea. The top floor was soon rejected as entailing too much getting upstairs after the day's work. The second floor contained no room of exactly the dimensions required, but on the first floor there was a choice of two or three rooms which would, as far as size went, suit admirably. The landlord was strongly in favour of number 17, but Mr Anderson pointed out that its windows commanded only the blank wall of the next house, and it would be very dark in the afternoon. Either number 12 or number 14 would be better, for both of them looked on the street, and the bright evening light and the pretty view would more than compensate him for the additional amount of noise. Eventually number 12 was selected. Like its neighbours, it had three windows, all on one side of the room. It was fairly high and unusually long. There was, of course, no fireplace, but the stove was handsome and rather old, a cast iron erection on the side of which was a representation of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, and the inscription, One Bog Mose, Cap 22, above. Nothing else in the room was remarkable. The only interesting picture was an old coloured print of the town, date about 1820. Supper time was approaching, but when Anderson, refreshed by the ordinary ablutions, descended the staircase, there were still a few minutes before the bell rang. He devoted them to examining the list of his fellow lodgers. As is usual in Denmark, their names were displayed on a large blackboard, divided into columns and lines, the numbers of the rooms being painted in at the beginning of each line. The list was not exciting. There was an advocate, or Safiora, a German, and some bagmen from Copenhagen. The one and only point which suggested any food before was the absence of any number 13 from the tail of the rooms, and even this was a thing which Anderson had already noticed half a dozen times in his experience of Danish hotels. He could not help wonder whether the objection to that particular number, common as it is, was so widespread and so strong as to make it difficult to let a room so ticketed, and he resolved to ask the landlord if he and his colleagues in the profession had actually met with many clients who refused to be accommodated in the 13th room. He had nothing to tell me, I am giving the story as I heard it from him, about what passed at supper, and the evening, which was spent in unpacking and arranging his clothes, books and papers, was not more eventful. Towards eleven o'clock he resolved to go to bed, but with him, as with a good many other people nowadays, an almost necessary preliminary to bed, if he meant to sleep, was a reading of a few pages of print, and he now remembered that the particular book with which he had been reading in the train, and which alone would satisfy him at the present moment, was in the pocket of his greatcoat, then hanging on a peg outside the dining room. To run down and secure it was the work of a moment, and, as the passages were no means dark, it was not difficult for him to find his way back to his own door. So, at least, he fought. But when he arrived there, and turned the handle, the door entirely refused to open, and he caught the sound of a hasty movement towards it from within. He had tried the wrong door, of course. Was his own room to the right or to the left? He glanced at the number, it was 13. His room would be on the left, and so it was, and not before he had been in bed for some minutes, had read his wanted three or four pages in his book, blown out his light and turned over to go to sleep, did it occur to him that, whereas on the blackboard of the hotel there had been no number 13, 
There was undoubtedly a room numbered 13 in the hotel. He felt rather sorry he had not chosen it for his own. Perhaps he might have done the landlord a little service by occupying it, and given him the chance of saying that a well-born English gentleman had lived in it for three weeks and liked it very much. But probably it was used as a servant's room or something of the kind. After all, it was most likely not so large or good a room as his own, and he looked drowsily about the room, which was fairly perceptible in the half-light from the street lamp. It was a curious effect, he thought. Rooms usually look larger in a dim light than a full one, but this seemed to have contracted in length and grown proportionately higher. Well, well, sleep was more important than his vague ruminations, and to sleep he went. On the day after his arrival, Anderson attacked the Risakiv of Vibor. He was, as one might expect in Denmark, kindly received, and access to all that he wished to see was made as easy for him as possible. The documents laid before him were far more numerous and interesting than he had at all anticipated. Besides official papers, there was a large bundle of correspondence relating to Bishop Jürgen Fries, the last Roman Catholic who held the see, and in there cropped up many amusing and what he thought were intimate details of private life and individual character. There was much talk of a house owned by the bishop, but not inhabited by him, in the town. Its tenant was apparently somewhat of a scandal and a stumbling block to the reforming party. He was a disgrace, they wrote, to the city. He practiced secret and wicked arts, and had sold his soul to the enemy. It was a piece of the gross corruption and superstition of the Babylonian church that such a viper and blood-soaked troll man should be patronized and harbored by the bishop. The bishop met these reproaches boldly. He protested his own abhorrence of all such things as secret arts, and required his antagonist to bring the matter before the proper court, of course, the spiritual court, and sift it to the bottom. No one could be more ready and willing than himself to condemn Mag Nicholas Franken if the evidence showed him to have been guilty of any of the crimes informally alleged against him. Anderson had not time to do more than glance at the next letter of the Protestant leader, Rasmus Nielsen, before the record office was closed for the day, but he gathered its general tenor, which was to the effect that Christian men were now no longer bound by the decisions of bishops of Rome, and that the bishop's court was not, and could not be, a fit or competent tribunal to judge so grave and weighty a cause. On leaving the office, Mr. Anderson was accompanied by the old gentleman who presided over it, and, as they walked, the conversation very naturally turned to the papers of which I have just been speaking. Herr Scavenius, the archivist of Vibor, though very well informed as to the general and the documents under his charge, was not a specialist in those of the Reformation period. He was much interested in what Anderson had to tell him about it. He looked forward with great pleasure, he said, to seeing the publication in which Mr. Anderson spoke of embodying their contents. This house of the Bishop Fries, he added, it is a great puzzle to me where it can have stood. I have studied carefully the topography of old Vibor, but it is most unlucky. Of the old terrier of the bishop's property which was made in 1560, and of which we have the greater part in the archive, just the piece which had the list of the town property is missing. Never mind, perhaps I shall some day succeed to find him. After taking some exercise, I forget exactly how or where, Anderson went back to the Golden Lion. His supper, his game of patience, and his bed. On the way to his room it occurred to him that he had forgotten to talk to the landlord about the omission of number 13 from the hotel, and also that he might as well make sure that number 13 did actually exist before he made any reference to the matter. The decision was not difficult to arrive at. There was the door of its number as plain as could be, and work of some kind was evidently going on inside it for as he neared the door he could hear footsteps and voices, or a voice, within. During the few seconds in which he had halted to make sure of the number, the footsteps ceased, seemingly very near the door. He was a little startled at hearing a quick hissing breath as of a person in strong excitement. He went on to his own room, and again he was surprised to find out how much smaller it seemed now that it had when he had selected it. It was a slight disappointment, but only slight. If he found it really not large enough, he could very easily shift to another. In the meantime, he wanted something. As far as I remember, it was a pocket handkerchief, out of his portmanteau, which had been placed by the porter on a very inadequate trestle or stool against the wall at the farthest end of the room from his bed. Here was a very curious thing. The portmanteau was not to be seen. It had been moved by officious servants, doubtless the contents had been put in the wardrobe. No, none of them were there. This was vexatious. The idea of a theft he dismissed at once, such things rarely happen in Denmark, but some piece of stupidity had clearly been performed, which was not so uncommon, and the stupee must be severely spoken to. Whatever it was that he wanted, it was not so necessary to his comfort that he could wait till the morning for it, and he therefore settled not to ring the bell and disturb the servants. He went to the window, the right hand window it was, and looked out on the quiet street. There was a tall building opposite, with large spaces of dead wall. 
no passers-by, a dark night, and very little to be seen of any kind. The light was behind him, and he could see his own shadow clearly cast on the wall opposite. Also the shadow of the bearded man in number 11 on the left, who passed to and fro in shirt sleeves once or twice, and was seen first brushing his hair, and later on in a nightgown. Also the shadow of the occupant of number 13 on the right. This might be more interesting. Number 13 was, like himself, leaning on his elbows on the window sill, looking out into the street. It seemed to be a tall, thin man, or was it by any chance a woman? At least it was someone who covered his or her head with some kind of drapery before going to bed, and, he thought, must be possessed of a red lampshade, and the lamp must be flickering very much. There was a distinct playing up and down of a dull red light on the opposite wall. He craned out a little to see if he could make any more of the figure, but beyond a fold of some light, perhaps white material on the window sill, he could see nothing. Now came a distant step in the street, and its approach seemed to recall number 13 to a sense of his exposed position, for very swiftly and suddenly, he swept aside from the window, and his red light went out. Anderson, who had been smoking a cigarette, lay at the end of it on his windowsill and went to bed. Next morning he was woken by the stupige with hot water, etc. He roused himself, and after thinking out the correct Danish words, said as distinctly as he could, You must not move my portmanteau. Where is it? As it's not uncommon, the maid laughed and went away without making any distinct answer. Anderson, rather irritated, sat up in bed, intending to call her back, but he remained sitting up, staring straight in front of him. There was his portmanteau on its trestle, exactly where he had seen the porter put it when he first arrived. This was a rude shock for a man who prided himself on his accuracy of observation. How it possibly could have escaped in the night before he did not pretend to understand. At any rate, there it was now. The daylight showed more than the portmanteau. It let the true proportions of the room with its free windows appear, and satisfied its tenant that his choice after all had not been a bad one. When he was almost dressed he walked to the middle one of the free windows to look out at the weather. Another shock awaited him. Strangely unobservant he must have been last night. He could have sworn ten times over that he'd been smoking at the right-hand window the last thing before he went to bed, and here was his cigarette end on the sill of the middle window. He started to go down to breakfast, rather late, but number 13 was later. Here were his boots still outside his door, a gentleman's boots. So then number 13 was a man, not a woman. Just then he caught sight of the number on the door. It was 14. He thought he must have passed number 13 without noticing it. Three stupid mistakes in 12 hours were too much for a methodical, accurate-minded man, so he turned back to make sure. The next number to 14 was number 12, his own room. There was no number 13 at all. After some minutes devoted to a careful consideration of everything he had had to eat and drink during the last 24 hours, Anderson decided to give the question up. If his sight or his brain were giving way, he would have plenty of opportunities for ascertaining that fact. If not, then he was evidently being treated to a very interesting experience. In either case, the development of events would certainly be worth watching. During the day, he continued his examination of the Episcopal correspondence which I have already summarised. To his disappointment, it was incomplete. Only one other letter could be found which referred to the affair of Mag Nicholas Franken. It was from Bishop Jorgen Fries to Rasmus Nielsen. He said, Although we are not in the least degree inclined to assent to your judgment concerning our court, and shall be prepared if needed to withstand you to the utmost in that behalf, yet forasmuch as our trusty and well-beloved Mag Nicholas Franken against whom you are dared to allege certain false and malicious charges, have been suddenly removed from among us. It is apparent that the question for this time falls. But for as much as you might allege that the Apostle and Evangelist St. John in his heavenly apocalypse describes the Holy Roman Church under the guise and symbol of the Scarlet Woman, be it known to you, and etc. Search as he might, Anderson could find no sequel to this letter nor any clue to the cause or manner of the removal of the Casus Belli. He could only suppose that Franken had died suddenly, and as there were only two days between the date of Nielsen's last letter, when Franken was evidently still in being, and that of the Bishop's letter, the death must have come completely unexpected. In the afternoon he paid a short visit to Hull, and took his tea at Beeklund. Nor could he notice, though he was in somewhat nervous frame of mind, that there was any indication of such a failure of eye or brain as his experiences of the morning had led him to fear. At supper he found himself next to the landlord. What, he asked him, after some indifferent conversation, is the reason why in most of the hotels one visits in this country the number 13 is left out of the list of rooms. I see you have none here. The landlord seemed amused. To think that you should have noticed a thing like that. I've thought about it once or twice myself to tell the truth. An educated man, I've said, has no business with these superstitious notions. I was brought up myself here in the high school of Vibor, 
And our old master was always a man to set his face against anything of that kind. He's been dead now this many years, a fine outstanding man he was, and ready with his hands as well as his head. I recollect us boys, one snowy day, he here plunged into reminiscence. Then you don't think there is any particular objection to having a number thirteen, said Anderson. Ah, to be sure. Well, you understand. I was brought up in the business by my poor old father. He kept an hotel in Aarhus first, and then, when we were born, we moved to Vibor here, which was his native place, and had the Phoenix here until he died. That was in 1876, then I started business in Silkibor, and only the year before last I moved into this house. Then followed more details as to the state of the house and the business when first taken over. And when you came here, was there a number 13? No, no, I was going to tell you about that. You see, in a place like this, the commercial class, the travellers, are what we have to provide for in general. And put them in a number 13? Why, they'd as soon as sleep in the street, or sooner. As far as I'm concerned myself, it wouldn't make a penny difference to me what the number of my room was, and so I've often said to them, but they stick to it that it brings them bad luck. Quantities of stories they have among them of men who have slept in a number 13 and never been the same again, or lost their best customers, or one thing and another, said the landlord, after searching for a more graphic phrase. Then, what do you use your number 13 for, said Anderson, conscious as he said the words of a curious anxiety quite disproportionate to the importance of the question. My number 13? Why, don't I tell you there isn't such a thing in the house? I thought you might have noticed that. If there was, it would be next door to your own room. Well, yes, only I happened to think, that is, I fancied last night, that I had seen a door number 13 in that passage, and, really, I am most certain I must have been right, for I saw it the night before as well. Of course, Herr Christensen laughed at this notion to scorn, as Anderson had expected, and emphasised with much iteration the fact that no number 13 existed or had existed before him in that hotel. Anderson was in some ways relieved by her certainty but still puzzled and he began to think that the best way to make sure whether he had indeed been subject to an illusion or not was to invite the landlord to his room to smoke a cigar later on in the evening. Some photographs of English towns which he had with him formed a sufficiently good excuse. Herr Christensen was flattered by the invitation, and most willingly accepted it. At about ten o'clock he was about to make his appearance, but before that Anderson had some letters to write, and retired for the purpose of writing them. He almost blushed to himself at confessing it, but he could not deny that it was the fact that he was becoming quite nervous about the question of the existence of number 13, so much so that he approached his room by way of number 11, in order that he might not be obliged to pass the door, or the place where the door ought to be. He looked quickly and suspiciously about the room when he entered it, but there was nothing, beyond that indefinable air of being smaller than usual, to warrant any misgivings. There was no question of the presence or absence of his portmanteau tonight. He had himself emptied it of its contents and lodged it under his bed. With a certain effort he dismissed the thought of number 13 from his mind, and sat down to his writing. His neighbours were quiet enough. Occasionally a door opened in the passage and a pair of boots were thrown out, or a bagman walked past humming to himself, and, outside, from time to time a cart thundered over the atrocious cobblestones, or a quick step hurried along the flags. Anderson finished his letters, ordered in whiskey and soda, and then went to the window and studied the dead wall opposite and the shadows upon it. As far as he could remember, number 14 would be occupied by the lawyer, a staid man, who said little at meals, being generally engaged in studying a small bundle of papers beside his plate. Apparently, however, he was in the habit of giving vent to his animal spirits when alone. Why else should he be dancing? The shadow from the next room evidently showed that he was. Again and again his thin form crossed the window, his arms waved, and a gaunt leg was kicked up with surprising agility. He seemed to be barefooted, and the floor must be well laid, for no sound betrayed his movements. Safiora Herr Anders Jensen, dancing at ten o'clock at night in a hotel bedroom, seemed a fitting subject for a historical painting in the grand style, and Anderson's thoughts, like those of Emily in The Mysteries of Uldofo, began to arrange themselves in the following line. When I return to my hotel at ten o'clock p.m., the waiters think I am unwell, I do not care for them, but when I've locked my chamber door and put my boots outside, I dance all night upon the floor, and even if my neighbour swore, I'd go on dancing all the more, for I am acquainted with the law, and despite all their jaw, their protests I deride. Had not the landlord at this moment knocked at the door, it is probable that quite a long poem might have been laid before the reader. To judge from his look of surprise when he found himself in the room, Herr Christensen was struck, as Anderson had been, by something unusual in its aspect, but he made no remark. Anderson's photographs interested him mightily and formed the text of many autobiographical discourses, 
Nor is it quite clear how the conversation could have been diverted into the desired channel of number 13, had not the lawyer at this moment begun to sing, and to sing in a manner which could leave no doubt in anyone's mind that he was either exceedingly drunk or raving mad. It was a high, thin voice that they heard, and it seemed dry, as if from long disuse. Of words or tune there was no question. It went sailing up to a surprising height, and was carried down with a despairing moan, as of a winter wind in a hollow chimney, or in an organ whose wind fails suddenly. It was a really horrible sound, and Anderson felt that if he had been alone he must have fled for refuge in society to some neighbour bagman's room. The landlord sat, open-mouthed. "'I don't understand it,' he said at last, wiping his forehead. "'It is dreadful. I have heard it once before, but I made sure it was a cat.' "'Is he mad?' said Anderson. "'He must be, and what a sad thing. Such a good customer, too, and so successful in his business, by what I hear, and a young family to bring up.' Just then came an impatient knock at the door, and the knocker entered without waiting to be asked. It was the lawyer, in Dishabille, and very rough heard, and very angry he looked. "'I beg pardon, sir,' he said, "'but I should be much obliged if you would kindly desist.' Here he stopped, for it was evident that neither of the persons before him was responsible for the disturbance, and after a moment's lull it swelled forth again more wildly than before. "'But what in the name of heaven does it mean?' broke out the lawyer. "'Where is it? Who is it? Am I going out of my mind?' "'Surely, Herr Jens, it comes from your room next door. "'Isn't there a cat or something stuck in the chimney?' "'That was the best that occurred to Anderson to say, "'and he realised its futility as he spoke. "'But anything was better than to stand and listen to that horrible voice "'and look at the broad, white face of the landlord, "'all perspiring and quivering as he clutched the arms of his chair. "'Impossible,' said the lawyer. "'Impossible. There is no chimney. "'I came here because I was convinced the noise was going on here. "'It was certainly in the next room to mine.' "'Was there no door between yours and mine?' said Anderson eagerly. "'No, sir,' said Herr Jensen rather sharply. "'At least, not this morning.' "'Ah,' said Anderson. "'Nor tonight?' "'I am not sure,' said the lawyer with some hesitation. Suddenly the crying or singing voice in the next room died away, and the singer was heard seemingly to laugh to himself in a crooning manner. The three men actually shivered at the sound. Then there was a silence. "'Come,' said the lawyer. "'What have you to say, Herr Christensen? What does this mean?' "'Good heaven!' said Christensen. "'How should I tell? I know no more than you, gentlemen. I pray I may never hear such a noise again.' "'So do I,' said Herr Jensen, and he added something under his breath. Anderson thought it sounded like the last words of the Psalter. "'Omnis spiritus lord et dominum,' but he could not be sure. "'But we must do something,' said Anderson. "'The three of us. Shall we go and investigate in the next room?' "'But that is Herr Jensen's room,' wailed the landlord. It is no use, he has come from there himself. I am not so sure, said Jensen. I think this gentleman is right. We must go and see. The only weapons of defence that could be mustered on the spot were a stick and umbrella. The expedition went out into the passage, not without quakings. There was a deadly quiet outside, but a light shone from under the next door. Anderson and Jensen approached it. The latter turned the handle and gave a sudden vigorous push. No use. The door stood fast. Herr Christensen, said Jensen, will you go and fetch the strongest servant you have in the place? We must see this through. The landlord nodded and hurried off, glad to be away from the scene of action. Jensen and Anderson remained outside looking at the door. It is number 13. You see, said the latter. Yes, there is your door, and there is mine, said Jensen. My room has three windows in the daytime, said Anderson, with difficulty suppressing a nervous laugh. By George, so has mine, said the lawyer, turning and looking at Anderson. His back was now to the door. In that moment, the door opened, and an arm came out and clawed at his shoulder. It was clad in ragged, yellowish linen, and the burr skin, where it could be seen, had long grey hair upon it. Anderson was just in time to pull Jensen out of his reach with a cry of disgust and fright, when the door shut again, and a low laugh was heard. (laughs) Jensen had seen nothing, but when Anderson hurriedly told him what a risk he had run, he fell into a great state of agitation and suddenly that they should retire from the Enterprise and lock themselves up in one or the other of their rooms. However, while he was developing this plan, the landlord and two able-bodied men arrived on the scene, all looking rather serious and alarmed. Jensen met them with a torrent of description and explanation, which did not at all tend to encourage them for the fray. The men dropped the crowbars they had brought, and said flatly they were not going to risk their throats in that devil's den. The landlord was miserably nervous and undecided, conscious that if the dangers were not faced his hotel was ruined, and very loth to face it himself. Luckily, Anderson hit upon a way of rallying the demoralised force. 
Is this, he said, the Danish courage I have heard so much of? It isn't a German in there, and if it was, we are five to one. The two servants and Jensen were stung into action by this and made a dash at the door. Stop, said Anderson. Don't lose your heads. You stay out here with the light, landlord, and one of you two men break in the door, and don't go in when it gives way. The men nodded, and the younger stepped forward, raised his crowbar, and dealt a tremendous blow on the upper panel. The result was not in the least what any of them anticipated. There was no cracking or rending of wood, only a dull sound, as if the solid wall had been struck. The man dropped his tool with a shout and began rubbing his elbow. His cry drew their eyes upon him for a moment. Then Anderson looked at the door again. It was gone. The plaster wall of the passage stirred him in the face, with a considerable gash in it where the crowbar had struck it. Number 13 had passed out of existence. For a brief space they sat perfectly still, gazing at the blank wall. An early cock in the yard beneath him began to crow, and as Anderson glanced in the direction of the sound, he saw through the window at the end of the long passage that the eastern sky was paling to the dawn. Perhaps, said the landlord with hesitation, you gentlemen would like another room for tonight? A double-bedded one? Neither Jensen nor Anderson was averse to the suggestion. They felt inclined to hunting couples after their late experience. It was found convenient, when each of them went to his room to collect the articles he wanted for the night, that the other should go with him and hold the candle. They noticed that both number 12 and number 14 had free windows. Next morning, the same party reassembled in number 12. The landlord was naturally anxious to avoid engaging outside help, and yet it was imperative that the mystery attaching to that part of the house should be cleared up. Accordingly, the two servants had been induced to take upon themselves the function of carpenters. The furniture was cleared away, and, at the cost of many irretrievably damaged planks, that portion of the floor was taken up which lay nearest to number 14. You will naturally suppose that a skeleton, say that of Mag Nicholas Franken, was discovered. That was not so. What they did find lying between the beams which supported the flooring was a small copper box. In it was a neatly folded vellum document, with about twenty lines of writing. Both Anderson and Jensen, who proved to be something of a paleographer, were much excited by this discovery, which promised to afford the key to these extraordinary phenomena. I possess a copy of an astrological work which I have never read. It has, by way of frontispiece, a woodcut by Hans Sibald Biham, representing a number of sages seated round a table. This detail may enable connoisseurs to identify the book. I cannot myself recollect its title, and it is not at this moment within reach, but the fly levers of it are covered with writing, and, during the ten years in which I have owned the volume, I have not been able to determine which way up this writing ought to be read, much less in what language it is. Not dissimilar was the position of Anderson and Jensen after a protracted examination to which they submitted the document in the copper box. After two days' contemplation of it, Jensen, who was the bolder spirit of the two, hazarded the conjecture that the language was either Latin or Old Danish. Anderson ventured upon no surmises, and was very willing to surrender the box and parchment to the Historical Society of Vibor to be placed in their museum. I had the whole story from him a few months later, as we sat in a wood near Uppsala, after a visit to the library there where we, or rather, I, had laughed over the contract by which Daniel Salfanius, in later life professor of Hebrew at Konisberg, sold himself to Satan. Anderson was not really amused. Young idiot, he said, meaning Salfanius, who was only an undergraduate when he committed that indiscretion. How did he know what company he was courting? And when I suggested the usual considerations, he only grunted. That same afternoon he told me what you have read, but he refused to draw any inferences from it, and to assent to any that I drew for him. Well, that was a long one for Luke Law, but I didn't want to abridge anything. I just wanted to enjoy telling the story, and I hope you enjoyed listening. There have been a couple of television adaptations of this that I haven't actually caught yet. I've come away from this with a mighty need to go and find the year 2000's Ghost Stories for Christmas version by the BBC, which stars Christopher Lee. That's it for this year of Luke Law. I shall most definitely be returning in January 2024 with even more folklore from around the world. But, for now, blessed Yule Tidings, Merry Christmas, I hope no festive monsters manage to bother you, and a most happy new year to all of you. Luke Law is a Ghost Story Guys production. If you do want to contact me, there's a show's dedicated email, lukelawgsg at gmail.com, and the general show email, ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Both myself and the main show are really easy to find on Facebook and Twitter if you want to make day-to-day contact, as well as a very active Instagram account a lot of the community gets involved with. 
If you want to support the show directly, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. We do have Luke Law merchandise available at the Ghost Story Guys online store, so hopefully you got some of that for Christmas, and I'd love to see it online if you could share us a picture. We have an ongoing push to promote Luke Law more, and the dedicated Facebook group for the show is a pretty active success if you want to come join us over there. As ever though, the absolute best thing anyone can do to support the show is to give it a listen. Share this around if you think you may know someone who may be interested, leave a review if you get the chance to help Singler boost me more, definitely listen to even more Christmas scary stories at Christmas Eve if you're going on a roll, and most of all I simply hope you enjoy what I'm doing here. Goodbye for now. <laughs>